CSI Shakespeare is made possible by the support of the IU School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI, a public liberal arts college right in the heart of Indiana, with a commitment to innovation in the humanities and social sciences. Your humble patients pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge. A sampling of the words which have made William Shakespeare our most famous playwright. The play's the thing, wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king, Hamlet. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven, the merchant of Venice. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, Romeo and Juliet. She loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. Othello. Oh, that a man could reason down this fever of the blood. The history of Cardenio. Bet you don't know that one. It was a play that we know existed, um, but it was lost. We don't have the whole play. We have only the story that Louis Theobald gives us. It's kind of analogous to an art historian who has a painting and knows that there is paint on there that is not period. To kind of find the Shakespeare underneath. This was not a respectable thing for academics to be doing. He's toying with texts that people think are written by a man that people think you can't toy with. He uh, is not afraid of controversy. He, in fact, he might even said to court controversy. That something could be buried for all these years and now brought back to life is very exciting. I think it's, it's marvelous. There is an axiom older than ice that those that can do. And those that can't? Plagiarize. Case in point, one Louis Theobald, circa 1727, a playwright whose portfolio redefined the term dreck. He does not have a literary gift. He was not a good playwright. He has no discernible sense of humor. He just wasn't good at it. Nobody has ever revived a play by Theobald. Uh, nobody in their right mind would revive a play by Theobald. What microscopic talent Theobald did possess was in his devotion to a far, far better scribe, one whose sound and fury had shuffled off this mortal coil a century earlier. He's a wonderful editor of Shakespeare, the first really academic, historically serious editor of Shakespeare. He loved Shakespeare. So, if filch you must, filch from the finest. And in that year of 1727, Theobald raised eyebrows when he staged a play he wrote, Double Falsehood, calling it an adaptation of an original Shakespeare tome, a claim that would have received much skepticism had it not been met by derision. Was Theobald a fraud? Was that based on a Shakespeare manuscript or not? Now we know that Theobald was undeniably telling the truth. The Shakespeare he ripped off was called the History of Cardenio. We know that the play was entered for, uh, in the Stationer's Register, for example. We have uh, many documents that show that it was performed in the court of James. Which is sort of weird because it was a ripoff too. Our investigation shifts to sunny Spain, to a man, and to the closing chapters in what has been an ode to unhappiness. He fights in the very famous Battle of Lepanto, where he lost the use of his left hand. On the way back, he was traveling back to Spain, and his ship that he was on was attacked by pirates. And you can't make this stuff up. And then he spent five years of his life in an Algerian prison. He's tortured in this time, um, has a horrible experience. He's released, now he's disabled. He becomes what we would call today a tax collector. Eventually, he's put in prison in, in Spain because he's accused of larceny. He spends about two years in prison, so he basically has a very miserable life. 
ultimately he writes Don Quixote, publishes it, which is of course his claim to fame. He's about 58 years old at this time. And Miguel, never too late, de Cervantes, tale of questing klutziness, is an instant and global success, which does not escape the notice of England's most successful playwright. For, while a proficiency in penning preternatural poetry he doth possess, the need for original plots he does not. Shakespeare is totally comfortable lifting wholesale plots into his plays. He is not at all interested in creating original plots. That's just not what Shakespeare did. They didn't have to worry about copyright. You could take a brand new novel, like Don Quixote, just translated into English a few months before, and you could turn it into a play instantly. Yep, even if you're the bard when you're opting to filch, filch from the finest. After all, no copyright, no harm, no foul, right? Well, the real crime is this. The history of Cardenio did not survive the ravages of history itself. All that remains is Theobald's double falsehood, a gumbo of clunky rewrites and play-shortening deletions, with nary an original version of Cardenio extant anywhere. Well, if there's no literati delecti, I guess this case is closed. And as recompense for your trouble, dear viewer, we now turn our attention to some authentic Shakespeare. No, which is what these lines are. Reason presses patience. Patience? What else? My flames are in the flint. What this is also is no play other than the lost history of Cardenio itself, christening a new urban theater in the heart of Indianapolis that is an extraordinary tale of rebirth all on its own. Very proud of my actors and my students who are changing the climate at IUPUI as we speak. The theater was a cement shell when I arrived five years ago. Shakespeare once wrote, "'Tis the mind that makes the body rich." And a lot of goodly minds at the university decided to use the space to reach out to other minds still. The mission? Well, riches, of course. We were able to create um, a theater space for live theater in the campus center, which is, can also be used as a uh, cinema to benefit the campus and to also benefit Indianapolis. And yes, we um, were very proud to open the Campus Center Theater uh, with the history of Cardenio, and that was the champagne smash against the hull of the ship. For us, this is also a legacy. The, the webs and the students who put on theater here at IUPUI in the 80s and the 90s and didn't have a facility like this have come back home to watch us open this new facility and this performance. Now the webs, Edgar and Dorothy, know all about jumping into the deep end of performance. That's because IUPUI's original venue was a bit of quirkiness that, well, let's just say that theater starts with T and that rhymes with P and that stood for? The swimming pool is sloped down a little, just a little. So where the audience sat, there was a little bit of an incline down. It was still very shallow. The only theater we ever worked in were, albeit I'm pretty tall, you didn't need a ladder to set the lights. We used folding chairs, director's chairs, and these were folded up and put away in between performances. One of the instructors that had a classroom next to the scene shop often was lecturing at the same time I was teaching stagecraft. So he and I worked out a code and he'd lecture for a while and then he'd knock on the wall and then we'd start the saws and the hammering. From such humble beginnings, the theater program at IUPUI grew to host the Bonderman National Children's Playwriting Competition and number among its alumni, actress Christina Malandro. But then, after decades of its hour on the stage, it was heard no more. The university no longer offered a degree in theater. And that's why this premiere, where things once lost are found again, contains, to parody Theobald, some double possibilities. It gave me a flicker of hope that theater might be returned to IUPUI in a program that would also provide lots of opportunities for the students. But first things first, the play's the thing. So how was Cardenio reconstructed? 
Unearthing the bard beneath the bogus is the passionate pursuit of this man. Most of Shakespeare's plays were originally performed in the Globe Theatre on the south bank of the Thames River in London. The one thing everybody knows about Don Quixote, even if you haven't read the book, is that at a certain point he gets on his horse and he charges a windmill because he thinks the windmill is a giant. But in the early modern theater, you couldn't do that. So one thing we know about this lost play based on Don Quixote is that it did not contain the most famous incident in the entire novel. No windmills, no problem. For although the Don was all the rage at court, it was also the cast of secondary characters, most of all the sorely beset upon Cardenio, that impressed Shakespeare and his collaborator, a man 15 years his junior who, at one time, was considered to be the superior playwright of the two. Yep, that's true. John Fletcher. So who was John Fletcher? Well, you're about to be introduced to the oddest bodkins of an odd couple that ever joined forces. Shakespeare um, is a nobody from nowhere. He didn't want to stay there. He wanted to get out. And he was looking for and interested in the heroes of the classical world, the kings and queens of England. And he was consistently disturbed by failing to keep faith with the past. Um, this makes him a, a, a somewhat conservative figure. Fletcher was uh, the son of the Bishop of London. He is a very flamboyant character. He died relatively young. The story about why he died uh, is that the plague was raging in London, and the safest thing to do was to get out of London as quickly as possible. Um, but Fletcher stayed for one more day because he was waiting for a specially tailored suit to be finished and he stayed another day and he caught the plague and died. And what they had in common um, was that they were both interested in a new genre of play, a relatively new genre, tragic comedy. And that's actually part of the story in Don Quixote of the character Cardenio. It's a story that mixes uh, a lot of emotional grief and anguish and um, near-death experiences with comedy. So they seem to have each recognized that there were elements of these in, in this story that Fletcher would be particularly good at and other elements in the story that Shakespeare would be particularly good at. And that's fortunate for us because it makes it easier for us, the larger the chunks are, it makes it easier for us to identify who did which bit. One of the things that Fletcher did really well is he was a master of pace. His plays move very fast. When you think of a Shakespeare play, you don't think of it going fast. Shakespeare is a great master of metaphor. So that when you come out of that theater, you feel that your head is exploding with all the different ideas and feelings that have been packed into that very brief time in the theater. Personal betrayal is, is a major theme in his work and a major theme in Cardenio as well, and I think one of the things that would have drawn him to the story uh, that Cervantes tells in Don Quixote is that it's a story about betrayal. Fletcher in particular would have been interested in Don Quixote because Fletcher throughout his life had an enormous interest in Spanish literature. He's also um, a master of a certain kind of pathos. Women who have been abandoned are one of his great themes. And of course there is an abandoned woman in this play and most of her scenes are written by Fletcher. There's no question of that. You get this sort of collaboration often when you think that the two people don't fit very well together. So that you, if you take a song and you combine Dido and Eminem, part of the success of that is precisely that they're very different styles so that the result is something better than either of them would have done on his own. He likes not to accept received opinion without seriously questioning it. And that's a very good virtue in us, a very great virtue in a scholar. Professor Stanley Wells remembers the first time Gary and Cardenio's stars aligned. These days, Gary is a distinguished research professor at Florida State University. That's just part of a winding road that took this Kansas schoolboy to the pinnacle of Shakespearean research, when Professor Wells vaulted over a stack of more accomplished applications 
to call a fresh out of graduate school Gary to be his assistant editor on the prestigious Oxford University Press edition of Shakespeare, all because of a Bard-based essay contest that Gary entered and that Professor Wells judged. It was like winning the lottery without buying a ticket. Seven years later, their touchstone collaboration emerged. And just like the veteran Shakespeare and the precocious yeah, newbie Fletcher before yeah, them, quite, yeah. this writing duo pushed the literary envelope. Research um, is always a, a dialogue, um, and you can only participate in that dialogue if you have something new to say. And part of what you ha may have new to say is that the old theory doesn't work. The fact that he's so willing to question received opinion means at the same time that he puts people's backs up some, sometimes. He is not afraid of controversy. He, in fact, he might even be said to court controversy. Tucked inside the Oxford Shakespeare was but the briefest of nods to the lost play. But a seed had been planted. Twenty years ago, Gary set out to hypothesize what Shakespeare and Fletcher's lost sheep might have been like. That very typically of him, he tried to reconstruct the play, a lost play, on the basis of practically nothing, really. Now, Gary's efforts to unearth the very ancient have been sped up exponentially by something very, very new. We have to go through line by line, seeing if we can find evidence of Theobald interfering with the original play. Now, this sort of problem was insoluble until very recently. Because the only way that you can solve this problem, where you're having to do this kind of microanalysis, is by having very large databases. We can begin with a speech uh, near the end of the play, in the final scene of the play. And scholars have argued that this final scene is mostly written by John Fletcher in the early 17th century, but that it has been messed with uh, by Louis Theobald in the early 18th century. So if you look at this speech, the righteous powers at length have crowned our loves. What I've done here is I've compared everything in the speech, every word, every phrase, every image, to all of the works of Fletcher and to all the works of Theobald. And if there's a parallel to something from Fletcher, I put it in green. And if there's a parallel to something in Theobald but not Fletcher, I put it in orange. So you can immediately see that almost everything in this speech has parallels to Theobald, but not Fletcher. So we can just take this whole speech and throw it away. But we can now also look at another speech. For such sad rites must be performed, my lord. So if we pull that speech up, you can see I've done exactly the same thing as with the other speech. Elements of the speech that are paralleled in the works of Theobald are in orange, Elements of the speech that are paralleled in the work of Fletcher are green. But there's no orange. It's all green. There's nothing here that suggests the hand of Louis Theobald or anything from the 18th century. So this passage seems to be part of the original play written by John Fletcher, so let's keep it. And let's look at another passage. No impediment shall bar our wishes. This time, I've compared everything in the speech to, again, the works of Theobald, but also to the works of Shakespeare. Anything by Shakespeare is in royal purple. The whole passage seems to be entirely by Shakespeare. Even if you don't know anything about early modern poetry or drama, you can immediately see there are three different writers here. Unfortunately, databases can't solve all of our problems. Theobald gets rid of entire scenes and entire characters in his other adaptations. But it's, you can't perform a collection of fragments in the theater. I have to engage in a different kind of research that involves me writing speeches in the style of Fletcher and in the style of Shakespeare. What Gary's done is amazing. I mean, you could hand me you know, a list of 5,000 words and expressions. I couldn't write a play like Cardenio. It's a bold statement to claim that double falsehood is or could be Cardenio, and then to try to essentially unadapt it. He's toying with text that people think are written by a man that people think you can't toy with. We've got to block that and get it on and off stage. Which brings us to the part where our literati delecti becomes a corpus performed him. <laughs> 
Dr. Terry Boris came to IUPUI School of Liberal Arts, charged with creating partnerships between theater and the community. With no performance space but many collaborators, she turned to the unorthodox, once staging the courtroom scene from The Merchant of Venice in moot court at the law school. Now, it's been 26 years since that Oxford University Press edition of Shakespeare. Time for Gary to update it for the 21st century. They wanted a third general editor, and they wanted a woman, and they wanted a scholar who was well-versed in performance. And that's when Gary met Terry. I actually thought he was very old. I was surprised that he wasn't. As part of their work on the new Oxford Shakespeare project, Terry created Hoosier Bard Productions so that the team could test editorial decisions under the microscope of actual performance. And she caught the Cardenio bug, traveling as far as New Zealand to see various in-progress readings and student performances. And she made a promise to herself. For while Cardenio had had readings with actors such as Richard Dreyfuss and Whoopi Goldberg, it had never been staged as a full-scale production using professional actors for many of the roles. So I had the chance and I took it. The history of who? Who am I? At its core, the history of Cardenio is about, well, Cardenio, a man who loses his love to his best friend, goes King Leeringly mad, and then gets reunited with his lost love. It also contains a host of classic Shakespearean themes. It's the trifecta, race, class, and gender right there. These kinds of issues continue to be relevant to us, and so therefore the plays that contain those issues continue to be relevant to us. And this night, as Cardenio's cast of both pros and IUPUI student actors begins its web to weave before a premiere audience that includes scholars from around the world, it soon becomes obvious that the feedback on this show's going to come hot and heavy. Essential is an interesting casting decision, and not just casting, but his d description in the play. He's a young man in the play. In the novel, Sancho is a 40-something-year-old man with two kids. He's married. That didn't work in early modern uh, England. Um, they would have recognized an older man tutoring or bringing along with him an apprentice, Sancho. Uh, makes much more sense to be an apprentice, a young boy. There are as many virgins here as dragons. Both of these actors are black. And so I, I never hesitated uh, to cast them, but um, I was questioned about the wisdom of it. You may by deputation, as other great conquistadors have done, sell your black subjects into slavery. An African-American might take um, might not want to speak lines about slavery and being bought and sold and, and owning other people. And there are lines in the play that refer to that, and they're funny lines. Should they be funny? Are you a pygmy or an idiot? To me, as a scholar of Cervantes, um, I'm not thrilled with the way it portrays Don Quixote and Sancho themselves, because Don Quixote, as many centuries of readers you know, have come to appreciate has a deeper level. One of the biggest questions is the Don Quixote part, which is, of course, entirely written by Taylor because it doesn't exist in double falsehood. On the one hand, both Shakespeare and Fletcher were extremely likely to have a subplot. I mean, Gary's taken the plot from the Cervantes novel, of course, but to put those two together, that's pretty gutsy. Tis a hard world for women. But the most controversial aspect of the history of Cardenio may rest with the mixed-race character, Violenta. Your lord indeed, and master too, mm. and hungry. <laughs> she is coerced into sex. Violenta is put upon two times, and I had to spend time talking to her and working with her because she knew that in the uh, context of the play that this would uh, function like the best theater should always function. It should make you a little squirmy. It should make you think, but still the violence is there. And so after the scene, I would have to say, how are you guys doing? And they say, we're okay, bring it on. To ask an African-American actress to play a character who is repeatedly sexually violated throughout the play by men, and then to have her be with that, that initial white man that did it, I think it's very hard. 
Though Claymore Brown or no other would I choose were she a queen. I'm not sure that I totally am convinced that that is a Shakespearean move. It's disturbing for us as a modern audience. I think it's a, an ending that's very plausible for the play. I think it's an authentic ending. There's something of that in the ending of um, Measure for Measure. I think a lot of people, you know, at the time, you know, watching it in the early 17th century would have felt a sense of relief and thought, yes, finally, good. It is one of the benefits of 400 years of humanity that timelessly difficult themes have endings that have humanely changed with our times. But one thing that is constant as the Northern Star about theater in every age is the camaraderie only those behind the wings share. We got a real coffin from Abbey Monasteries, and it sort of creeped the actors out who had to get in the coffin, and they didn't like to be in the coffin with it shut. So we found little ways to uh, prop it open with gum, um, bubble gum, so they wouldn't feel like they were in a coffin. But then one day I went back and I couldn't find one of our actors and it turned out that he was in the coffin taking a nap. So they did get used to the coffin. <laughs> if you magicians clap your hands. And so we bring the curtain down. What is to be made of the history of Cardenio? and of the new venue that housed its most recent incarnation. IUPUI stands in a very, very unique and exciting position. Right now, the student body is growing every year, new departments and new schools being built. It's time now to have a theater department on, in an urban campus right next to a very exciting and increasingly dynamic city. I just hope that it keeps growing. I hope that more and more students can get involved. I wish them well in every way. It's been a long but also intellectually and creatively exciting process. The whole idea of theater as a form of research is to experiment, to try new things. I fundamentally agree with Gary that theater should be a place of experimentation, that we learn new things through theater. And I think that's what he's trying to get at. I think in many ways, he may not recognize this, I think his own endeavor is quite quixotic, to spend so much time doing something that is almost impossible. We're still wanting to see what if, we're still wanting to ask the question, what if Shakespeare wrote this play, Cardinio, and what would, if he did, what would it look like on stage? Upstairs in this building, so there is one of many conversations and discussions that are going on all weekend about the very topic of, uh, of this play. I think the culmination in its full production is, is really great. Uh, especially in this place. And if you can bring this to an audience, um, I think, why not? You know, I think Indianapolis could really use something like this. It's really extraordinary to take this on, and I think gutsy in all the right ways. It's a very hot topic. It's also a mystery um, that is only solved through brushing away years of misunderstanding what this play is, uh, what this play was, what this play represented, what this play represents. I look forward one day to Gary actually getting to the point where he can say, this is it, this is as accurate and as good as I can make it. I came out of it thinking, this play at some point touches glory. And to close, if the past half hour has not made you a believer in the karmic link between the Lost Play's literary giants, Cervantes and Shakespeare, then know this. Historians believe both men died on the same date in 1616. With endless tears that never cease, I saw a heart lie bleeding whose griefs did more and more increase. Her pains were so exceeding when dying. CSI Shakespeare was made possible by the support of the IU School of Liberal Arts at IUPUI, a public liberal arts college right in the heart of Indiana with a commitment to innovation in the humanities and social sciences.